forward. Oh, there she is. Sorry. She's filming today, so anyway. Um, yeah, we're going to do what? Live Facebook or something? That's what I'm going to try to do. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, Janine has been working on this Underground Railroad project for many years, like over 10 years, over a decade, researching, photographing. She actually photographed from from Louisiana to Canada. And the result of this project became a book. Let me show your book. This book right here, it's beautiful. It was published by uh, Princeton Architectural, Arch Architectural Press. Mm -hmm. And the shipment comes in next week. So we, we are taking pre-orders and since Janine lives in Dallas, she will be able to sign the books for you. So um, if you'd like a copy of the book, and it's only $40, which is very inexpensive for a photo book these days, um, go ahead and order through Louisa later after the talk. And um, not only is there a book published on this project, but there's also a traveling exhibition that's, that's going to go to small museums and uh, college campus museums, and uh, so it's, there's going a lot of attention on this project, which rightly so it, sh it should be. And we have the show too, so we're very pleased to have it. And Janine's here to talk about her journey. And uh, if you have any questions, I guess at the, end. at the end, that would be good. Okay? All right. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you, Missy and Louise and Bert and everybody for uh, putting this show together and um, allowing me to get the work in front of people. Uh, basically, it's uh, meant to be one person's view of what they would have seen on their escape to freedom circa 1840. Um, from research, I decided to try to figure out, um, I guess, the stops along the railroad and wanted to do a first person point of view of the project. And uh, it's like Missy mentioned, it took me over 10 years to research it. Uh, I started researching back before the Freedom Center in Cincinnati and before the Freedom Trail Initiative from Congress to actually try to locate all the sites. Um, my former career was in advertising as an art director. And so I would kind of work in my day job and then I would do research and I would get frustrated with my day job. And then I would get kind of stymied on the research and table it. So I kind of went back and forth for a number of years. And then uh, finally, about 2008 or 2009, I was going back to Indiana, which is where I grew up. And my stepdad suggested that I go to the Indiana Historical Society, and they have a massive research library there. And so um, I went in and I was kind of going through the computer and having them pull different stuff, like um, you know, the old Underground Railroad book from the 1800s, all this stuff. And finally, one person brought out this huge manila folder that just had all of these things stuffed into it. And as I started looking through it, it was actually this um, librarian who was an elderly volunteer librarian <laughs> Anytime she came across Underground Railroad, she would make a copy of it and stick it into this manila folder. So it had stuff from the 1800s all the way up to when I was researching. And so uh, finally, when I got my hands on that folder, that was like, oh my goodness, the gold mine of finding research. So that helped me kind of piece together more routes and start trying to figure out how to photograph and what I was doing. Um, so uh, what I did is I, I guess uh, we were headed to New Orleans, and so we decided to stop at one of the plantations on the way, with, which was actually um, one of the Cane River plantations. And this is Magnolia Plantation, and this print is entitled Decision to Leave. And so they have eight slave quarters still standing on the property today. And it actually is um, now a National Park Service, so if you're ever in the area, it's well worth stopping by. Um, it definitely has a sense of feeling when you're there, and when I was out shooting at night, the hairs on the back of my neck were standing on end. You could just feel the sense of place. And um, in its heyday, they had 350 slaves on the property. 
And they actually had an Eli Cotton or Eli Whitney cotton gin as well, and it's actually still there. Um, so basically, I think they said that they were making about eight hundred thousand dollars to well over a million dollars back then per year off of cotton, uh, just because of I guess you know we always think as Britons mean you know once you get to Britain you're free and you're safe. But they were ordering, placing orders for all of this cotton, so the bales that we were exporting to Britain were getting greater as each year progressed. And um, so then, when the uh, Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, then we were, that was when we had a first more slave showing up on the plantations. Um, I did notice from, I guess, slave narratives that I read, and I read a lot of books, slave narratives, etc. And I did try to, like, there's a quote here from Frederick Douglass on the front wall if you haven't seen it yet. But I tried to pull, uh, I guess, quotes or different texts from the time period so that you could get those people's and participants' voices back into the project so you could get a sense of what people were feeling. So um, if you do get the book or have happened to look through it, you'll see some of those quotes and stuff throughout the book and between the pictures. Um, so I started at the cotton plant plantation, and then in the South, uh, what I found through the slave narratives was that uh, basically slaves would run away, not necessarily for freedom all the time, but to protest. And so they would go to neighboring plantations for a week, two weeks, or a couple of days even, get some food or whatever, and then they would return back. Um, so I figured if you were actually running away to freedom, then you would probably be gravitating towards these plantations on your way north. So I tried to pick larger plantations because if somebody extra showed up, then maybe it wouldn't be as noticeable as if you had five you know, slaves on the plantation. If there's an extra person, you would know. So um, that's kind of the southern route, I guess, necessarily. It's very conceivable that they could have followed this path but I don't know for sure because when they were in the South, they were on their own. There was no support, unless they did have slave support, uh, you know, as far as clothing, directions, maybe some shelter, et cetera. And um, so really the contact with the Underground Railroad happened when they were crossing into the Northern states where they were free states. Um, so I kind of followed, I guess, across Louisiana, roughly the El Camino Real, and then hooked up with the Natchez Trace and roughly followed that up through um, Mississippi and then on into the, a little tiny corner of Alabama and then up through Tennessee, Kentucky, Indiana, Michigan, and then on to Canada. Uh, the reason that I chose not to go through the Detroit area was because slave catchers, after their slaves um, ran away, would go basically up to Detroit and wait. So they actually had a northern route that ran near Port Huron, just south of Port Huron, actually, and then they would cross there. And there was um, the St. Clair River between the two lakes, so it was narrower and easier to get across. Um, so this is entitled Southern Pine Forest, and it is in Louisiana as well. And they're kind of roughly in order, but kind of out of order, <laughs> just because of placement and stuff. So we have um, back here is a determining true north and the rain is on the left. And so basically, um, it's a, I found a quote that discussed the fact that you could tell the direction of north by moss growing on the side of the tree. So if it was rainy, you wouldn't actually know which way to continue traveling. Um, and then the image on the right is called Sunken Trace, and so that's an actually original section of the Natchez Trace in Mississippi. And then um, here we have is Tennessee, and this is actually called Devil's Backbone, which is the nickname of the Natchez Trace. But to me, it also looked like a backbone. And then also, it was a big ravine down in the ground, so I could just imagine using that as stairs to get up. Um, and then we have behind here, sorry, it's kind of logistically hard to go through all this. 
Uh, this is entitled Stop Over on the Right, and it is actually Frogmore Plantation in Louisiana. And um, it was a very large plantation as well. And uh, obviously they're still growing cotton on the property today. And there's a fabulous tour there that discusses, uh, I guess, the cotton plantation originally and the production of cotton and then how it's changed and what they're doing today. So again, if you ever get in the area, well worth stopping by and checking it out. Uh, right here on the left is called Keep Going. And I mentioned that sliver of Alabama along the Natchez Trace. So this was taken in Alabama, and you're basically looking into Tennessee and crossing the Tennessee River. And then we'll walk down this way. <laughs> The top one is called Hidden Passage, and it is actually in near Mammoth, or it's in Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, Barron County, Kentucky. And um, I don't, we don't know for sure if they went through Mammoth Cave, but we have documented evidence of the cities around Mammoth Cave, very close to it. Um, there was, I guess, a slave that was actually giving slave or um, cave tours back in the 1830s and 1840s. His name was Stephen Bishop. Um, the best, I guess, hand-drawn map that they have to this day, and it's actually the best map that they still have, was drawn by him by memory, by hand. Um, so he basically mapped this cave system. So the theory is, is that he could have had them come in one entrance and go out another entrance, and nobody would have been the wiser. When I did contact the National Park Service to actually photograph there, at first they were very hesitant about letting me come in because they didn't want to be connected with something that they weren't sure about. But the more I discussed the research and what I had found and stuff, basically they said, bottom line is, is we don't know, and if you do come across direct documentation, we would like it. So um, oftentimes, some of the stops I know that are completely verifiable, we know that people stop there. Other times they are word of mouth, but the Underground Railroad was a word of mouth thing, and there is enough documentation that I felt it was worth including that site in there. And then um, I did have a couple times afterwards where I would go back out and find research after I photographed that did verify stops. So, um, I, I think people are still constantly researching it in all of these spaces and areas and locations are coming out still. Uh, this is actually William, uh, William Beard. He was an abolitionist and this is his home. And I have a, kind of two stories about this. Um, as I was researching, I was trying to have, I guess, a route that I was following and I wanted it to be conceivable that somebody could have actually followed it. So I didn't want to say, oh, this stop was working in 1830, and then the next one they went to was running in 1850, and then, you, you know, I wanted the time period to match, and then it would be probable that you could go from one station to the next. And so I tried to, because as I would be researching, it was like going down a rabbit hole, and I would get lost and focused and be like, oh, this is fascinating, and be like, oh, this is like 75 miles from where I need to be, and then I'd go back. Um, but I kept coming across some research that was in Henry County, Indiana, which is off of my path. But since I kept coming across it, I decided to just look at it one day. And it was a handwritten minutes book from this uh, Henry County Female Anti-Slavery Society. So they pulled out the actual book from the you know, manuscript department at the library. And as I'm reading through the minutes, I notice that they are taking donations for funds to buy free labor cotton, and they are sewing that free labor cotton into clothing, and they're taking that clothing and they are shipping it to William Beard's house so that he can clothe the freedom seekers as they're coming north. So in a sense, it did tie to my route, but I just didn't know how. Um, and then also, I had, while I was researching, I kept coming across 
William Beard's name, so I knew that he was an abolitionist and a stop on the Underground Railroad, but I didn't know where in Indiana. And then I knew that they went through um, Union County, Indiana, which is where he was, and Liberty City, but I hadn't connected that the two went together yet. And so um, this work had won an award in uh, 2014 at Center Review Santa Fe. So four pieces were up on the wall there, and all the award winners, I think there were 12 of us, and then two grant winners, so everybody had work up on the wall. And uh, the woman who had her work next to me, her uncle showed up to the show, and he actually um, kind of, we started talking, and he grew up in Indiana, so we had that connection, and then we started talking about the project further, and then it comes out that he had ancestors on the Underground Railroad. They had a house. So we talked more. I figure out that it's William Beard's house that he's speaking of, his ancestors. And then he's able to give me the address and gel that those two points of reference together. And then I'm able to go out and, and photograph this house. So just random way of needing somebody to give me information. And that happened a lot on the project. And um, just being out in the middle of night at 2.30 in the morning, somebody decides to walk a dog and then they proceed to tell me, you know, some other locations. It's like, why did they walk out the door at that time to walk their dog? I don't know how, but we connected. Um, so let's see. So we kind of did a jump here, um, but over here is, where are we at? Okay. So this, um, back here on the wall, this panoramic image is actually entitled the River Jordan. And what you're looking at is literally the dividing line between the North and the South. So you're standing in Northern Kentucky and you're, those hills in the background are Indiana. And so if you guys are familiar, if you can hearken back to your history days, Kentucky was a border state. So technically it, it sided with the South and then Indiana would have been your free state. So you're literally that dividing line. And so once you crossed the Ohio River, then that's when you would have started hooking up with the Underground Railroad. There is a story that I found. There are actually three different stories of where the term Underground Railroad came from. Um, one was from New England. I can't remember exactly where the other one was, but one was from crossing the Ohio River. And it stated that Tice Davis was actually crossing the Ohio River and his owner was literally following him in a rowboat trying to catch him. And he was able to get across the river and then he disappeared when he crossed. And so the owner is quoted as saying he must have gone off on some underground road. And at that point he did hook up with the Underground Railroad and made it to freedom. Um, so that is that one. Then we have back here in the corner is actually Eagle Hollow from Hunter's Bottom. And so this was actually a system of about six or seven stops that were working together. And uh, there was a, a gentleman by the name of Chapman Harris that actually was a free African American. He was a reverend and he was also a blacksmith. He would signal to people on the Kentucky side that it was okay to cross the river with hammer strikes on his anvil. <laughs> then they would follow up through and um, like I said, there were a system of about six or seven houses that were going up through this section of Indiana. Um, on the right here, we have on the safest route where the cabin is and um, Rumor has it that Eliza Harris, who was made famous by Uncle Tom's Cabin, the book in 1852 that was published by Harriet Beecher Show, uh, she picked up uh, of Eliza's escape crossing the Ohio River when she, it was frozen, but it was still kind of melting, and as she's crossing with her infant in her arms, the ice is breaking apart. It's a, it's a terrible story, but she does make it across. And we do find reference to her getting at me by Coffin's house later on. So anyway, and supposedly she stayed at this cabin. Uh, there has been, I guess, a documentation that I found from the 1840s that she did, but then there are other people that say that she didn't because she was over here. So again, not, not detailed things. Um, 
So, but I, I tend to believe the stuff from the 1840s more than the other things later on. Um, but I'm trying to think of what else about that one. Oh, it was, um, I came across a story, and I, I, I'm not sure if this one is true, but supposedly Harriet Beecher Stowe was invited to the White House to meet Abraham Lincoln. And um, when she walked in to greet him, he said, basically, so you're the little lady that started this war. She was, that book was so important at that time period of exposing the evils of slavery. And um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, the next image is look for the gray barn out back. And this is actually a station. It was a Joshua Eliason barnyard in a farmhouse. And uh, there is a tunnel that has been closed off that uh, both farmhouses on either side of the tunnel verify its existence. They're both businesses now. Um, so that is that one. And then the next one over is Follow the Drinking Board. And there actually is a song called Follow the Drinking Board. And, uh, it discusses, I guess, a route to freedom and its directions. And again, questions on when the song was founded. I think the chorus they say was from 1929, but then the other lyrics they feel are from the 1830s, 1840s. Um, and then let's see, we're gonna skip over the one in the corner. Uh, back here, the two, the pairing back here, <coughs> to photograph the barn in that image is because he actually had a fault bottom wagon that he kept in his barn. And so he would put the freedom seekers in the bottom and have them lay down and put some boards over and pile grain on, grains on top and then drive them to the next station through the middle of town. He was dubbed the unofficial president of the Underground Railroad in the area. Him and his wife, Catherine, actually helped approximately 3,000 slaves in their eight years in Indiana. And they eventually moved to Cincinnati and continued their work there. They actually started in Indiana and then took the concept to Cincinnati when they went there. They had a, um, a free labor goods store. So they were selling uh, you know, cotton that was not produced through slave labor produce, etc. And that was the whole premise of the store back then. And there were some other stores in the area. And they were all part of the anti-slavery society there, Quaker. And the reason that they were so, I guess, adamant against slavery is because most of them came from North Carolina and they had witnessed the evils of slavery firsthand and knew what it was. And that's why they were so willing to help. Um, the image on the right is a cornfield, and uh, the reason that I shot the cornfield is actually it's the Union Literary Institute, and it was a school for African Americans back then, and a lot of the focus was on agriculture and trying to help them find a way to support themselves and make a living. Uh, <clears throat> the schoolhouse actually, a tornado had hit it a couple years before, and so it was pretty decimated, and they hadn't gotten enough funds back together to put the schoolhouse back together. But I thought that the cornfield was interesting as well because I came across a story that I found and it was actually, I guess, some memoirs that somebody had put together of helping. And um, there was a group that had left one station house and then as they were leaving to go to the next station house, the sheriff of Jefferson County, Indiana was Wright Ray, and he actually used that office and that position to be a slave catcher. So he had a group of people that worked for him <coughs> regularly. Well, as they're leaving the one station going to the next station, they went to the house that they had left and were watching. Well, they also went to the house that they were going to. So they had nowhere to go and they were stuck. So they basically um, took them to a neighbor's house and they didn't know if the neighbor would be okay with them having them stay in their cornfield overnight, but they took a chance. And they took them into the cornfield and they actually knocked on the neighbor's door and said, 
by the way, we have some fugitive slave Titans in the cotton fields. Is it okay? And it turns out that they were. But the reason that they were so hesitant was because you actually had pro-slavery people living right next door to anti-slavery people all throughout Indiana. So you didn't really know if it was okay or not okay. Mm -hmm. You didn't really know people's views. Um, so, and then I guess the next two over here, one is called Nightlight, and that is actually passing into Fayette County, Indiana. And then the other one on the right is entitled Friend or Foe. And uh, I guess, again, two interesting stories about friend or foe. I was actually, um, I guess, do, I had some research that said that they went around through this county, but again, no, no idea of an address or the house or anything. And so uh, my stepdad and my mom and I were driving, and so we went into Metamora, Indiana, and I figured antique malls you know, people that have an antique mall like old things, maybe they like history, maybe they'll know. So we asked a gentleman in there if there was a house nearby on the Underground Railroad, and he said, as a matter of fact, there is, and he gave me the address of this house. So we, it's about maybe 15 miles outside of town, northeast, and then we drove out there and knocked on the door, and nobody was home. And so I'm like, all right, well, I'll do some research later and figure out if it's actually on the Underground Railroad and verify it, and then we'll come back and, and photograph it. Because it actually took me about three and a half years to photograph the whole series. Uh, so I think it was maybe two years later, uh, we had been out photographing, and it was pretty late at night, and we were driving back home, maybe 2.30, 3.30 in the morning. And, and we're driving past this house. And so I decided, well, we're here, it's night, I might as well just take the photograph just in case it is on the Underground Railroad and then I can, you know, have that one done. And so as we set up to photograph, we're noticing that you can see the glass is kind of overgrown in the image. And so we're wondering kind of, well, the house was taken care of and now it looks like it had been taken care of, but most recently it hadn't. And so, um, Actually, I put a flashlight in the window, and that's what illuminated the window. And so we were kind of, uh, I guess, like the county road is, is literally right here, so you're not very far from the street. So you can just see um, all these cars driving by, and as they're going by, they're, you know, obviously the local residents, and they're very curious what we're doing out there at 2.30, 3.30 in the morning. So you can see them slow down. So I said to my stepdad, I, I think the police will be here soon. <laughs> <laughs> so sure enough, two police cruisers show up. And um, the one guy jumps out, the first guy that arrives, and he's, he's completely quizzing me on what I'm doing. So I'm telling him, you know, explaining the project, the story, etc. <laughs> Meanwhile, um, I try to take different vantage points when I get to a site. So I'll take Point, you know, pointing out the house, all the way around the house. Sometimes I'll be at the house pointing out and taking pictures. So by the time he got there, I already had my camera turned away from the house. So as I'm telling him that I'm photographing the house, he's <laughs> looking at my camera, not quite believing me. So anyway, I was able to keep on explaining and everything. And then, um, as I was talking about, I wasn't sure if the house was on the Underground Railroad or not, the second policeman stepped forward and said, oh, I can verify that the house was on the Underground Railroad. This is actually my father-in-law's house, and it's in probate. Um, then he was able to discuss the uh, family that had lived there back in the 1840s and 50s and give me the names and stuff that I needed to research to verify the house. So, and then, um, let's see, over here is the second to last image in the series. So you're all the way up in Michigan now. There are 83 total images in the series, so we had a limited space, and that's kind of why we're jumping around when I'm telling the story. But this is called Within Reach, and so the reason that I decided to shoot it at sunrise is because you're getting that close to be able to be moving around in daytime and freedom and light in Canada. And so um, it's, it is a uh, what you're looking at is across the St. Clair River is Canada, and so that 
that is where freedom is. And I found that I guess there's a station there that Warren spoke to Thompson House. I think it was actually a school as well. And um, so that is the, I guess, within reach. And then the freedom in the book is the last image and that is in full daylight. And you're basically looking back across the river at the United States and slavery from the freedom vantage point. So does anybody have any questions? <laughs> she, uh, we, we came over here one Saturday and the other gallery across the street and we visited three exhibits including this one and the next thing I know I've got three essays to write. <laughs> um, so I was impressed, sorry impressed, my inspiration was the uh, photograph, the, um, the sparkling <laughs> so here it goes. Trees are interesting to me because I feel there is some power and freedom in being a tree. And I love the connection, and I have a love connection with them because they give us so much more than CO2 and photosynthesis. I've always wanted a Christmas tree farm when I don't think, well, where I don't think I'll allow people to cut down, cut them down at all, but adopt them and decorate them. My year-round holiday forest and put gifts underneath them mm -hmm. for those in need to come and collect on love and offerings from others. Nearly every photograph in this Freedom of Two Hands Round Railroad series has trees with ancient gifts attached to them and underneath them for those of us in need of history lessons to learn from them. Like the gift of an unknown field slave advocating for just for as long as we could, she could before being summoned back to wet nurse chores, and the gift of the sorrowful wails of mothers of runaways captured and returned in shackles, or the gift of ghosts of those who met their demise with a rope and whip or flames and tar and feathers, flesh hanging, embedded, blood draining, bonding them to the trees and grounds their roots again. These trees, having been there through the fire, no longer dominated by the looming shadow of death, survived to deliver a simpler semblance of energy, captured through the lens, the camera lens of genuine Jacob Bailey. I once rode with native friends to from Zacharosa, Mississippi, actually deep into the route via plantations and never ending rows of huge trees that have been there since before slavery, I'm sure. It was during an intramural sports tournament from Meridian to the Gulf Port and Pensacola and back. All of us in the van, without question, were African American descendants of slaves. So very quiet and still, we imagined the select few ancestors must have known those trees and the path through them to freedom or untimely death. We were awestruck by the beautiful landscape, but mournful of the ugliness and hatred and anguish come alive through these trees before our very eyes. A couple of days ago, I posted one of my iPhone photos from the exhibit to my Facebook page, tagging a friend who was on this trip, asking him if he remembered the drive 
and what we were thinking and speaking, thinking of our attitudes about life as we've been so slain. He responded sweetly, yes, all too well, it's hard to forget. This is what Dale's exhibit wants to teach us, that the trees and their landscape and their sacred ground bore witness to it all, and they're now like the evening news announcing, reminding us of our connection to the past. And I believe her decision to photograph at night was so she could capture <coughs> the amazing and small and not bright but perfectly formed breast of invisibility camouflage that a runaway headed for the underground required, black on black. No human model is necessary for this effect. Just use your best imagination and listen to these trees to know who is once there. <laughs> <laughs> so we made a good team. 
<laughs> but, um, so that's what I would do like when I start to think on a topic. I'll just write any old word that comes into my mind. And so um, for some reason, I had gotten on the topic of the Underground Railroad, and it just kind of, the idea flowed out onto the page. And I think that it chose me more than I chose it. And I think uh, I feel that way a lot now, especially in retrospect, when I talk about those situations where I would get stuck and somebody out of the blue at some exhibition or in the middle of the night would help me fix what I was stuck on. And so it was really, really helpful and very uh, serendipitous project. Uh, I'm curious to know that, um, well, we, we all know the history of uh, Harry Stubbs in regards to the Underground Railroad, but I'm curious to know were there any other names that we may not, we may not have heard and um, so the question was other names different than Harriet Tubman that we, we um, maybe now are learning about. And I, as you'll see, there I have two quotes by Frederick Douglass. That's because I'm fascinated with him. He had an amazing life. And um, but uh, yeah, I came across quite a few people that were in the Midwestern area that I hadn't really known that much about. And I, I'm sure some people have heard of them, like Sojourner Truth. And I didn't, I didn't know her details, though. I heard her name, but I didn't quite know her details. And um, but there were other, I guess, um, I, you know, a lot of the people that I, the site page stuff that I had photographed, and then like Chapman Harris, I didn't know about. And there is a. Obviously, all this was by foot, so how long would the journey take, and what was the odds of survival? Um, it was about 1,400 miles, and it wasn't, I guess, it's a zigzag path, so sometimes, you know, they weren't going direct route. And the majority of the people that did escape to freedom uh, were coming from northern states. The Deep South was a rare thing. It didn't happen often because they had so much more terrain and you know, things to cover. 
Uh, so I know estimates range depending upon which historian you speak with. So it could be anywhere from 50,000 to 100,000 people that made it to freedom. And you would have had uh, anywhere from that starting in the 1800s up through the Civil War, or some people say like 1830 through the Civil War. Uh, but you had four million slaves at the time that the Civil War started. So you can guess the odds from there. Anybody else have any questions? Um, you be, you be, um really compliment them mm -hmm. oh, yes, as a yes. yes. I have one question about, um, I read part of your book and about the uh, claim that uh, the quilt didn't play a major role in buying home for guidance to the slaves that were going to Canada. Yes, it's interesting. Again, um, I know because there was a whole book that was published on that out of South Carolina. So me, I, again, it depends on the historian that you talk to. The majority of the historians, because there is no documentation on it, it didn't happen to them because the historians are all about documentation. Well, there's something called an oral history. And exactly. Among quilters, and I happened to go to a quilt show last night, there were quilters who talked about these signs, these symbols in the quilts that are, uh, and by the way, you show it at the end of the I was supposed to take a look at it. Yeah. Uh, these quilters have been talking about this, passing this word down from generation to generation, and those quilts, uh, some of them have, you know, been as far back as slavery. So, there's, um, you might say, an unwritten oral history about how the stars are a bit different, um, that door that you talked about, and uh, the quilts, the images that are in the quilts were signs that let the slaves know, and also the people in the safe houses know what you know, the road and the uh, passage was. I, I, yes, I, and again, that, like I mentioned earlier about some of the sites, like the Mammoth Cave site, um, as far as, you know, we don't have the documentation, but we can guess, and it's an oral thing. So yes, I, I, I tend to believe that maybe there were times that quilts were used, but again, as a historian would say, then some of these spots shouldn't have been photographed because we don't have the actual documentation as well either. But I felt like because of the oral tradition of the Underground Railroad, those things needed to be included. I have a question. I'm going to have to go check that oh. out. <laughs> Do you know how long it goes on? Uh, it should be there for a while. They have the old Oh, OK, great. I have a quick question. Did uh, you visit any of the HBCUs when you were doing any of your research? I did not. I would think that they would have quite a bit of information as well. I know Southern University has a massive amount of sl slave narratives that you could actually access online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I did have a lot of online references and different things, but um, yeah, again, it was a lot of things. Yeah, I'm so, sure yeah. there's a lot of information to carry through. Yeah, exactly. And it was, at times too, it would get so heavy reading those slave narratives that I would have to kind of put them away and, and do something happy for a while before I could go back. Oh, I understand. I've tried to read some of them myself. It's, it's, it's hard. It's, it's very, very, hard. very hard. So it's going to be the words, obviously. Okay. Mm -hmm.
children, just bring everybody. It's important for us to have, and we're very proud of it. Uh, just uh, know that we have several more weeks in the show. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you.